欧盟火车头熄灭，德国经济负增长。There is also a hyped up discussion that Germany is becoming the European patient. Looks like the economy is gearing at the red light in a way. It's gonna be a stalemate. Atmosphere is not good. 中德商会年度信心调查出炉。Those that stay here. Particularly, the top ten in European business、uh, is, is putting more money than ever into the country. 风云对话专访中国欧盟商会前主席伍德克。政府预算危机，火车司机持续罢工，红海危机导致供应链中断。新年伊始，德国经济面临重重挑战。一月三十日，德国联邦统计局的数据显示，去年第二、第三季度德国经济增长均出现停滞，第四季度环比下降百分之零点三，全年德国 GDP 下降百分之零点三，德国成为了二零二三年唯一负增长的主要发达经济体。最新经济数据公布后，德媒指出，德国经济处于衰退边缘。伍德克是德国在中国著名的商业代表，与中国结缘已经四十余年。二十一世纪初，他参与创建中国欧盟商会，并三度担任主席，为推动欧中经贸投资合作做出了贡献。Mr. Wutka, it's great to have you back at Phoenix Center. Thank you very much for well, joining us today. For inviting me, it's a great pleasure. It's good to see you again. Now let's begin with a discussion on Germany's economy. Now we know since the beginning of 2024, we've seen the economy isn't doing so great. We all know Germany used to be a powerhouse, and the question is, is the economy at a standstill? And what is going on? Would you please explain to us? Well, of course, for Europe,、uh, the German economy is incredibly important,、uh, given the manufacturing、uh, powerhouse that、uh, we are still a powerhouse, I would say. But we are limping powerhouse. We have a real shock from the energy prices. The Ukraine war has、right. really、uh, caused a lot of damage to our,、uh, particular manufacturing areas in high electricity. Uh, like steel, chemicals, and so forth, and then of course the inflation that rippled、uh, through the whole country、uh, mm -hmm. has brought basically Germany's economy to a standstill. I guess last year we had 0.3 percent minus growth,、um, and it doesn't look much better for this year. If we are lucky, we get above 0.4. So, and you can see on TV the strikes,、uh, right. uh, people like、uh, farmers、uh, on the street blocking the road. We have、mm -hmm. constant strikes with the train station and so forth. No, So Germany is going through a versatile, really big、uh, crisis. On the other hand, we've seen the International Monetary Fund has issued the latest figures. Now, Germany has overtaken Japan as number three when we talk about nominal GDP. And、yeah. How do you look at these figures? Well, it, it depends. I mean, Japan is frankly actually doing quite well right now, much better、mm. than Germany. So it's it's sort of a snapshot.、Uh, I look rather at the video of a period of time. Uh, the stock market in Japan、mm. does exceedingly well.、Uh, Germany,、uh, mm -hmm. the stock market uh, is is limping along. Uh, no, I think that we really have to、uh, see how we get our homework done.、Uh, mm -hmm. How we、uh, actually,、uh, Japan has shown us in a way how they could get back on their on their feet. What's the prospects looking like? I mean, what's your prediction if you were to? Predict a growth figure.、Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact,、uh, outlook is not very promising. But our people in associations are complaining in Europe is that we are overregulating everything. There is a、right. real feeling like in a、mm -hmm. straitjacket by too many of these、uh, laws, regulations coming out.、Uh, so,、mm -hmm. in a way, we have a coalition of three different parties.、Uh, Uh, it's red uh, uh, and yellow and green.、Uh, it's like <laughs> traffic.、It、looks like the economy is gearing at、uh, the red light in a way. It's really、uh, going to be a stalemate. The atmosphere is not good. 德国联邦政府此前计划将抗击新冠疫情基金剩余的六百亿欧元转移至气候与转型基金。然而，去年十一月，德国联邦宪法法院裁定此举违反了德国宪法。这一裁决使该基金出现了六百亿欧元缺口，严重影响到德国二零二四年预算。德国未来几年的大部分高新技术与气候保护相关产业，如芯片、绿色能源，包括部分基建项目等，均需该基金提供部分支出。为此，联邦政府不得不紧急磋商如何减少财政支出。
德国三大经济研究机构下调了二零二四年经济增长预测，称预算危机拖延了经济复苏。And I think the government really suffered a blow in November last year when Germany's top court threw out the budget. I mean, how did that impact Germany's economic recovery? How does that come into play? There have been a number of issues where we think that uh, the government is not really up to speed when it comes to regulations. They're not. They're doing in a way a sloppy job, you know. Uh, and we talk about 60 billion dollars in this November uh, for the green technologies earmarked uh, leftovers from the COVID, and the court uh, decided against it. I mean, that requires a bit of homework. How you actually make that process happen, and uh, it has it has been more of a psychological blow than a, a real uh, financial blow. 60 billion for Germany is not much, but at the same time required the government come back and look at the budget 2024, which they then approved. So in a way. Uh, what really bothered the business community is the kind of feel it has been done in a sloppy handwork, meaning not really professionally. And again, where else do we expect this kind of uh, sloppy handwork uh, popping up in our economy? Uh, so in a way, it, it was quite a blow, yes. And how should the government respond, really, in your opinion? Well, I mean, the government is supposed to do uh, a proper job uh, with assessments before they go live and do this. But again, we have right. three parties. That's not easy uh, uh, to coordinate. I guess the most important is now for us that the government is projecting that they will be deregulating the economy, that instead of coming up with new regulations every week, uh, we are going to see a government maybe that is more able in order to cut through the whole regulatory uh, tsunami that we are facing. And not just in Berlin, it's also uh, the same uh, in Brussels. Right. And ease it. It's a supply chain law, it's the investment screening law and so forth. And some of these laws have, uh, of course, an impact on our China business. And then it goes into broad uh, things, you know, how can we jack up and get our financial sector going again? We're a little bit backward there. We have virtually no, very little venture capitalists, for example. Mm. So it's, it's, it's going to be quite something. And again, in our society, June, July, we have elections in Germany, mm -hmm. European elections, local elections, and next year we have our national elections. Mm -hmm. And that normally hampers the kind of decisiveness of the government to do something uh, drastic. Germany is not uh, the sick man. Uh, Germany is, after a very successful period since 2012 and these years of, of crisis, uh, Germany is um, um, a tired man. And now we have a good cup of coffee, which means structural reforms, and then we will be continuing to succeed economically. There is also a hyped up discussion that uh, Germany is becoming the European patient <laughs> once again. I mean, how do you look at these comments? Is it a description of the disorderly society that is uh, being witnessed by people? Well, I mean, if you look back the last 20 years on the cover of The Economist magazine, you, you have Germany as the sick man of Europe, and then mm. I think it was three or four years as the shining star, uh, mm -hmm. best performer in Europe, and now again right. we are the sick man of, of Europe. Mm. Uh, it's a bit cyclical sometimes, but now it feels a bit more structural that uh, right. we really have to do something on energy, on deregulation, and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, our education system is limping along. Uh, we have big problems of having engineers, for example. Uh, we have the biggest challenge politically on the immigration side. You know, 1.5 million uh, immig immigrants came to our country alone in 2015, and we have, I think, 500, 600,000 immigrants every year in our country. Mm. And, and they have to be put up somewhere. They have to be and fed, what are they sheltered. Doing, these immigrants? Well, they're mostly refugees from Africa and, and uh, uh, Northern Africa in particular, mm. uh, of course, Iraq, uh, Syria, and so forth. Lots mm. of people uh, still see Germany as a very wanted place uh, right. to come over, and then, of course, Ukraine. Ukraine war changed everything. The energy prices, mm. our export to Russia uh, were scaled back. Uh, then, of course, the, uh, the situation is that we had, I think, at one stage, a million Ukrainians uh, coming to our country. Mm. Um, and uh, m many of them were integrated in cities, in, in houses, in schools, and so forth. Huge stress, particular on the local governments and mayors, right. which I think they have dealt really well. So it's not that mm -hmm. the whole government as such is, is performing badly. I think local level, they're really heroes to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, uh, it, is, it is politically difficult 
uh, for parts of our society to accept that many. And so we all mm -hmm. of a sudden have a development on the right side. Uh, the so-called AFD is rising in populace, and now we have uh, the left party, a new uh, political leader who's very charismatic. So all of a sudden on the fringes of our society on the party level, all of a sudden we have more extremist views. And of course that feeds into uh, the mm -hmm. kind of how do you look at Germany. And as mm -hmm. business, I think we're quite worried about these extremists anywhere in our government represent. Do you think the stability from the Merkel era, would that ever come back? Well, it had an upside, certainly stable, good communications and so forth. At the same time, mm -hmm. the government under her, in particular in the final years, uh, was not really doing something on economic reforms. Mm -hmm. It was more administration rather than reform. And hence, I think the, the roots of the problems we have uh, today are partly also uh, laid in those uh, final years of the Merkel uh, mm -hmm. regime. So in a way, um, uh, we have to see how we get out of it. Uh, many are calling for a modernization of the German economy. How do you comment on that? Modernized, again, deregulation, uh, stop having, uh, you know, the, uh, particularly the small to medium-sized uh, companies uh, strangled uh, by too many regulations. Multinationals, big companies sort of can venture out, go to other countries, sort of see where they can gain technology gains there that they can incorporate uh, back home. Germany's backbone economic-wise is small and medium-sized enterprises. We have many so-called hidden champions and that these companies have to be pampered, these companies have to be relieved from tax burden and so on. So in a way that requires also good education and our country is producing too few people interested in science, technology and so forth. Uh, that's where China has a very strong point, uh, coming up with the right people. 二月十日，彭博新闻社网站刊登题为《德国的超级工业大国时代即将结束》的报道。报道中指出，自2017年以来，这个欧洲最大经济体的制造业产出一直呈下降趋势，下降速度随着竞争力减弱而正在加快。2022年夏天的能源危机是重要的催化剂，受打击最严重的部门之一是化工行业，这是德国失去廉价俄罗斯。天然气的直接结果。德国化学工业协会最近的一项调查显示，由于向清洁氢的过渡仍不确定，近十分之一的企业计划永久停产。Germany's industrial sectors account for greater proportion compared to a lot of the other European countries, but with the Ukraine crisis, exports from Germany is being affected. And how does that impact the industrial sectors of Germany? I think the biggest impact was really inflation. It was the mm -hmm. uh, jacking up of, of gas prices, uh, uh, gasoline prices, uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. It was like a shock. You know, the Russian economy is the size of the Guangdong economy. So it was not mm -hmm. really a major loss for us. For some companies, certainly it was a problem. Mm -hmm. It was the energy shock, which really put us in a corner. Mm -hmm. And we still suffer from very high prices. And mm -hmm. so in a way, uh, that has been partly resolved by having LNG terminals built. Uh, we have more. Uh, of green technologies, China's uh, solar mm -hmm. panels helped to certainly to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, we are limping along, uh, not only on, on the energy side, but also on the innovation side. Uh, mm -hmm. Our universities are not producing enough good engineers in order to help us get into this new cycle, uh, for example, on in internet. The U.S. sparkles there and then China becomes a manufacturing powerhouse. So in a way, we, we're having a problem now that uh, China mm -hmm. is challenging us on the manufacturing side, you know. Mm -hmm. After we have been uh, basically bringing so much technologies to China, now China can bring technologies to us. Mr. Moritz Schullerich, who is the president of the Kiel Institute of World Economy, he recently said Germany once bet on Russian gas being a source of cheap energy. And the U.S. always ensuring that Europe would have no security concern. And now Germany seems to have lost on both bets. Yeah. What's your view on that statement? Well, again, we had a deep and meaningful relationship with Russia over decades. Uh, the gas was flowing. The gas was uh, rather inexpensive. It helped us to build up the kind of wealth uh, that we have uh, generated over years. Of course, when it then was stopped, uh, uh, all of a sudden we looked at uh, half-empty uh, caverns and, and uh, high energy prices. Again, the U.S. Mm. helped us uh, with exports of LNGs, but it also showcases in a way a country has to diversify in energy. Maybe right. we became too complacent on mm -hmm. supplies uh, coming out of Russia. 
Um, we have technologies that we could have actually generated gas in our own country with mm. fracking. That's what the U.S. does. But it was environmentally not acceptable. Mm. Um, we had the best nuclear power stations in the world and uh, the German society decided against nuclear power. So mm -hmm. in the midst of the crisis, uh, we turned off our nuclear power stations, mm -hmm. whereas we see countries like France and Finland and others actually building up nuclear power. So right. in a way, it, it is um, uh, ideologically driven, I guess. I'm for nuclear power. I think it's mm. a sensible carbon-free te technology. But again, uh, we have a society consensus going against it. So the government then had to be forced to shut it down. Merkel started that process in 2000. Uh, I think 11. So in a way, it's a problem that, yeah, Moritz, who is a friend of mine heading this Kiel Institute, has pinpointed it. Uh, that's the economic complacency we had on energy supplies coming cheap. And the second is, of course, security. You know, all of a sudden we have a war at our borders. Mm. And uh, the U.S. has been, of course, always been our protector. Mm -hmm. But now with the Trump election possible, again, we have to look into how much do we want to spend on our security. It's mm. good we spent another 100 billion. Uh, that was the decision, but again, it's it's pretty. It's in a way too little, too late. But anyhow, we are moving the right direction. China and Germany have announced the 2023-2024 financial reporting report. The report shows that while the 2023 year for the China economy is not easy for the Chinese economy, but China has the potential to be a strong market player. Over 91 of the interviewed Chinese companies said they will continue to expand the China market, not to leave China. More than half of the interviewed Chinese companies have said they plan to expand the China market in the next two years. 百分之四十六的受访德企计划与中国合作伙伴增进合作，以保持竞争力。受访德国企业还认为，中国企业的创新领导能力不断增强，其中汽车行业企业最为明显。Now, before 2023, China was uh, Germany's largest trading partner for a consecutive seven years. Now. And starting from last year, we've seen this is changing a bit now. There's the rhetoric that we need to reduce dependency on China, right, from uh, yeah. Germany's side. Yeah. How do you think this has impacted trade and economic relations yeah. between China and Germany? Well, first of all, I guess, yes, we are large trading partners, but very lopsided trading partners, you know. Mm. And you look into the container movement, Europe-China, it was about uh, 6.4 million uh, containers going west to Europe uh, and only 1.6 mm -hmm. coming back. Our president of the European Chamber, Jens Esklund, mm -hmm. told us that the ratio went from mm -hmm. 2.9 uh, containers mm -hmm. a couple of years ago mm -hmm. to China, one going west, now it's 3.7 or 3.8. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we are the largest and most important market for the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. you know. And we would like to do more, again, market access issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, we have um, uh, exports to, to China which are uh, important to us, but in size, too insignificant. Mm -hmm. We just exported in 2022, 24, 23 uh, percent more to China than to Switzerland. So the Swiss economy nearly being on level like the Chinese is obviously not acceptable. So what I really hope is that Chinese companies are going to Europe, invest in Europe, that companies not just uh, like Medea or mm. BYD or CATL come mm -hmm. uh, be part of our economic fiber. That helps us to deflate mm. the question of like you have to get away from China. So let China come to us mm. as investor. Now, York, you mentioned uh, companies such as BYD, and I think you previously stated, uh, or predicted rather, when the freighters were put into use <laughs> in 2025, yeah. there might be a car tsunami yes. into Germany. Yes. Well, in a car that you export out of China, be it BYD as a Chinese brand, be it Tesla as an American brand, be it BMW, Mercedes, as European brands, the mm -hmm. tsunami indeed is coming as a warning because we can see that in 2027, uh, China mm -hmm. has the ability of exporting 4.2 million cars more than the export now, you know. And again, our, our market is very, very open. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have uh, uh, the situation that, uh, of course, these products are not just cheap, they're excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, they have the technology of the future, digital as well as battery. Mm. So there are two answers to that. One is we have to get better ourselves. So in a way, we welcome competition if it is, uh, in a way, uh, on a level playing field. And that's what the European Commission is looking into, is how many subsidies went there. To what extent has the Chinese car industry been sort of jacked up 
uh, with government support and how do we have to respond to this one. Mm. My, my sense is there will be a response, but it will not be a response that actually uh, is going to hinder mm. Chinese exports to Europe. Um, again, my hope, and I guess uh, many of my German friends are of the same opinion, is we hope that China becomes more important as a supply chain within mm. our economy in Europe, and that's what we have to work for. Be competitive, learning mm -hmm. from China in this respect. 一月二十四日，欧盟委员会发布《欧洲经济安全一揽子计划》。这项重磅政策以所谓去风险、强化供应链韧性、维护经济安全为由，推出一系列措施。有分析指出，该计划表明欧盟首次将安全与贸易连接起来，并提升到战略高度。希望欧盟遵守自由贸易、公平竞争、开放合作等市场经济的基本准则。遵守世贸组织规则，避免出台逆全球化、泛安全化的政策举措。On the 24th of January, we've seen the European Commission issued the European Economic Security Package, which is the EESP, launching a series of measures that would maintain economic security.、Yeah. What is happening here? Well, in a way, it has been building up over many years uh, because Germ Germany or France and other countries, uh, to various degrees, have been extremely open, you know. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, we, we, we were found ourselves as a dumping ground for products. We found ourselves deprived of energy. We found ourselves in a trade war with the Trump administration on cars and on steel. So I guess the learning was like we have to actually expand our toolbox. Uh, if you have a toolbox, it doesn't mean that you become a protectionist or that you use your toolbox. But the fact is that you actually have to find a way how to uh, protect your interests uh, and, and, and have your population accept、mm. the fact that we need uh, uh, more government involvement in some areas. Mm. Well, we have to see how they work out.、Um, but again, we always worked in business that they are being misused for protectionist purposes. Let's see. I hope it's not going to be the case、uh, with this toolbox. Right. I mean, with the expansion of toolbox, I mean EESP, is it targeting China specifically?、Um, no. The、I、Chinese Chamber of Commerce have、yeah. voiced、um, yeah. that、uh, this may impact the confidence、yeah. of Chinese companies、yeah. investing in Europe. Well, it's first of all, wonderful to see that、uh, China has established a very vocal、uh, chamber in Brussels and in Berlin,、right. uh, replicating what、uh, Europeans have been doing here in China. We need their voice at the table、uh, in、right. order to speak up.、Uh, and again, the government has to prove that they are not protectionists. They have to prove that they are not targeting specific countries、uh, in order to make sure that this is a, a widely acceptable tool. And if countries have problems, they can go to WTO and challenge this. And I think that might happen. As a matter of fact, you know, we're looking at the carbon border adjustment mechanism, for example. Uh, taxation of products coming out of countries with a high carbon footprint,、uh, primarily based on coal. We have to see、uh, who is targeted there. But of course, China matters big time because China is the big exporter into the European Union,、um, and hence、uh, they will be impacted more than other countries that are certainly more in niches and, and less、uh, exposed. So, let's see if our、uh, politicians, diplomats, can find a way how to communicate this before. So, in a way. Again, toolbox is there.、Uh, let's see if it's required to be used by our politicians. Now, we've seen recently there is a hyping up of rhetoric that says foreign capital and foreign companies are withdrawing from China. Yeah. How do you respond to criticism such as this? Yeah, the key word I think was used by U.S. Secretary of Commerce、uh, Gina Raimondo. China became uninvestable. You know. And in a way, I understand where she's coming from because she refers to a certain kind of investment fund managers, Wall Street in particular, coming over here. And、uh, as you have seen from the market,、uh, the stock exchange in China,、uh, it has been a huge challenge.、Uh, it has been dropping、uh, like a stone. The area where we come from, in particular the European Chamber members, is the real economy. You know, it's primarily chemicals,、uh, cars,、uh, machine building. And so forth, and of course,、uh, we don't see any exodus there.、Uh, we see actually people coming up with ideas of putting more money into the economy. We have on the fringes more exits、uh, than before, partly also because Chinese customers are moving out of China into other areas with cheaper labor cost or less political tension, and so on and so on. In a way,、uh, that's like a flying geese syndrome. Chinese companies go to Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam. 
and then our suppliers uh, enter, enter that market. The second is some companies indeed are leaving the market because they can't compete anymore. Mm -hmm. That's not a political statement, that's an economic competitiveness problem that we are facing for some companies. Overall, I would say uh, it is, yes, declining a little bit, but those that stay here, particularly the top 10 in European business, uh, is, is putting more money than ever into the country. How do you look at European companies' prospects, future prospects of doing business in China? Uh, definitely. Uh, the outlook is that it, it will remain a very interesting market. Um, uh, recent speeches I gave are labeled as shall I stay or shall I go, this good old clash song from the 90s, you know. Where shall I go? Where is the second China? Uh, people point at India, but if you look at the difference of China and India in GDP terms, mm -hmm. now it is 15 trillion US dollars different. So if China has the next four years very bad economic growth, say 2%, and India certainly will have 6 to 7 percent. The difference in 2028 will be 17.5 trillion dollars. So we go from 15 to 17.5 trillion. And 17.5 trillion dollars is a very interesting figure. It's the size of the economy of the European Union. So if you look at the cake, at the size of the market, of course you want to stay here. Let's go to the next one.